Good afternoon. Today I'm doing an interview, our fifth interview in our series on uh, Christian individuation with Nancy Pfaff. And Nancy has been very gracious to spend a lot of time with us to describe how she has experienced individuation through her lifetime as a woman. We've done four previous videos. I'll put the links to the four videos that came before in the description of this video so that you can go back and listen to how things happen for Nancy over her lifetime. And so this is the fifth interview. I don't know if it's the last, but it certainly is toward the end of the process. Thank you, Nancy, for being with us. Nancy holds a master's degree in Christian spirituality and has been a consultant to a variety of fundamentalist Christian churches over many years. She has a very interesting perspective on these matters. And so welcome, Nancy. Uh, Hi, why, don't, why, why don't you introduce what we're going to talk about today? So today we're going to be look at, at the deepest and hardest dying cycle that I have been through, and then also the resurrection part, the rebirth, and I think you'll be really excited with the rebirth. I won't be going into great detail about the breakdown, but just enough to give you an idea of what was a crushing kind of suffering. And I'm sharing this because sometimes we go through really dark times where we cannot cope and we need other people to help us. And I want anyone in that situation to know that there's hope. So I was able to go through this dying process this time because of it was a transformational loss. And one of the things I learned to do when, you're, when I was feeling so helpless and powerless is to just lay my helplessness before God, to just open up to the self to just let that flow of energy between us be present and to just wait moment to moment to see what will happen rather than try to make anything happen. So we're going to look at the first image called Jonah and the Whale. And this is taken from the story of Jonah in the book, Jonah in the Old Testament. And this card was painted by Sister uh, Michael of the Carmelites here in Reno, and their website is carmelofreno.com. And the card says, if I should pass the tomb of Jonah, I think I would stop there and sit for a while, because I was swallowed once deep in the dark and came out alive after all. And that very definitely describes my summer. I was swallowed by the whale, and I was in the dark. One of the things that helped me understand what was going on was the book, The Impact of God, and that would be image number two. So I found myself in the belly of the whale in the dark, and one of the books that helped me was The Impact of God by Ian Matthew, which is a book about St. John of the Cross, who wrote that the deepest transformation that God works in a person is the dark night of spirit. And so that was what's going on with me. And St. John of the Cross, when he experienced the dark night of spirit, felt that he was sharing in the dying and rising of Christ. And I was comforted by Christ in agony on the cross because that was what was happening to me on the inside a great agony. Looking through my journals, I ran across a prayer I made in 1977, and here I am 77 years old in 2019. And the prayer I addressed to Christ was, I want to know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in your sufferings. And that's from Philippians 3, verse 10. And that was answered through this crisis. I did know Christ in his sufferings and Christ in his resurrection. So we're going to go to image number three. And this is a book by 
uh, Donald Calshed called Trauma and the Soul. And it was helpful to me to understand how trauma had been a part of leading up to this breakdown. So I'm going to read a short passage from his book. Trauma leaves us with many deforming mirrors and with a sense of ourselves that is less than and different than the real person we are. We are free from the standpoint of soul, but we don't know it. This is because after trauma, defenses are set up in the inner world, dissociated defenses, and these defenses distort what we are able to see of ourselves and others. They become anti-wholeness factors in the psyche. They disintegrate and fragment us. The distorting mirrors are created in acute suffering of trauma. And once established, they perpetuate suffering. So to begin what was going on, what led up to this breakdown, I'm going to go through quickly through the factors that were going on and trauma in childhood left me a weak foundation. So that was the first factor. The second factor was that in 2014, when, after my partner had been diagnosed with a terminal illness, the stress of that caused the chronic fatigue syndrome to return. In 2017, in January, my partner broke off our relationship and didn't want any further uh, contact, and I lost track of what was happening to him, how his health was, what was happening. During that period, my 13-year-old dog died, and those of you that have loved your pets, you know how hard that is. Then about a month or two later, I got notice that Lee had died. My doctor changed my medications and I went into a hormone imbalance where I was having hot flashes 30 to 50 a day. So I was not getting any sleep. I was in deep grief, a complicated grief, and also with undiagnosed clinical depression. Then I was diagnosed with a melanoma, which is a dangerous form of cancer and had to have surgery on top of being very ill. Following that surgery, there were two more surgeries, and my disability from the chronic fatigue syndrome increased. Then I was diagnosed with abnormal blood cells in my eyes and began to have to have shots in the eyes, prevent myself from going blind. The doctor put me on an anti-anxiety anti-anxiety medication, which led to having suicidal thoughts. At that point, I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was weak. I knew the power of the unconscious. I knew that it was possible for me to take my life, but I did not want to take my life. So I went to a counselor that I had gone to in the past, and she recognized my condition, and she said, I need to send you to a hospital or to one of your adult children. And as it turned out, I went to my daughter's. But she said to me that I was depressed physically, depressed emotionally, depressed mentally, and depressed spiritually. It was very painful, very painful ego defeat to not be able to take care of myself and to have my daughter come with her father and pick me up and take me to her house. What my prayer was during this time was simply a longing, just a longing. I, I felt so lost, longing for God, longing for understanding. And uh, one of the things, one of the poems that speaks to this that's so beautiful is Rumi's poem, The Love Dogs, and Coleman Barks reads that so beautifully. If you Google that, it's worth your time. And part of that poem says, The grief you cry out from draws you towards union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. And that helped, helping to, helped me to see that the pain I was in was really a connecting factor 
that I was connected to God through my pain. Incredible summer. How did you have the presence of mind to think about individuation and um, you know going going to your Christian faith as a way to solve it? That's well, you know, having been a Christian for so many years, uh, I I had my conversion. Ex- I, I was raised as a child in a Christian church and then had an adult conversion experience at 27 years old. So it had been a very long time of having a personal relationship with the God of love so that there was a heart connection there. We might say uh, the ego self axis was connected. And so there, I was receiving strength from beyond myself. I was receiving spiritual help uh, in that, terms of intuition and thoughts, uh, books that came my way, and I'll be sharing more about uh, how the advanced reading group helped. Uh huh. And uh, of course, that's what Dr. Kalshid talks about in Trauma of the in Trauma and the Soul, where he talks about you know there's something something from our deep unconscious that is that comes to our aid at times of difficulty yes and that's that's the incredible story in that book i mean i found the i found the story of the little girl who was prevented from going into her father's room by an angel, by a vision of an angel. And it turned out that later on, her mother got very angry at her because she wouldn't go to her father's room. And it turned out that her father was dead. And so this vision came up to prevent her from finding her father dead until her mother could be a mediator in the realities of life. Yes, there, this power that is greater than ourself is real, and it is personal, and it is connected with our real lives and Truly. interacting with us at all times. Yeah, and it clearly comes up at times of trauma because we find um, in the Bible many stories. I mean, the, the story of Abraham and Isaac is an example of that, where I, obviously Abraham was in a very traumatic situation, thinking that he had to sacrifice Isaac. And uh, another example is Jacob at the river, of course, where uh, he's sort of traumatized by the fact that he's going to go face his brother after many years. And uh, he ends up wrestling with the angel, and he gets the blessing of the angel. And there, therefore, is able to found the nation of Israel, and um, so it's uh, so those are examples of how a traumatic situation can come to your aid. But okay, yeah. so we've digressed, and I, I'm sorry for that. But I wanted to. Oh, I'm glad you asked. Yeah. Okay, so I we're going to go back to the. I'm going to put you back on speaker view, and I'm going to bring up the slideshow again. So here I am in this terrible situation, lots of internal pain, confusion, physical problems. And how is God involved? Well, I think we get an idea from this scripture in the New Testament from John 15 verses 1 and 2. Jesus is speaking. He says, I am the vine and my Abba is the vine grower who cuts off every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, but prunes the fruitful ones to increase their yield. So this is how I understood what was happening to me, that I was being pruned by God, that this was not a chaotic situation. This was something that was necessary and something God was a part of, and it was a great help to me. But sometimes when we are going through these times of pruning, it's as if God is our enemy, a darkness, an evil. And we don't, may not even recognize that until after we're out of that dying cycle and can look back on it 
and rejoice in the improvement and enlargement of our psyche and our personality, which wipes all the tears away. So now we're going to go from this darker place to the rebirth cycle. And I'm excited to be able to tell you this. Well, I think that's a very important lesson there, Nancy, because the Job archetype, as we've talked about before, sounds very much like this, where you run into something that defeats you, and then you lament about it, but then you're reborn, and it's a cycle that goes on throughout life. It's not a question of having death, it's a, it's a question of you know, you run into some adversity and, okay, it might stop you briefly, but then you're able to work out what the problem is and go on with your life, even if you have to find an entirely new path, which I've had to do any number of times. I'm not that much younger than you are. <laughs> do you relate to what I just said? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, yes. and so I don't, I don't recall in my own Christian upbringing anybody properly explaining that verse to me and properly explaining the importance of that verse to me. And could you tell me how it was brought up in your personal <laughs> upbringing or experience so that we can understand? Yes. Well, I don't remember what church I was in at the time, but it was probably a church that focused on the Bible a lot. And so I was constantly in the scriptures, reading them, reading them over and over, meditating on them, using the practice of Lectio Divina to see what would come up in my soul. And there were so many times in my life, which we've talked about earlier in the other interviews, uh, that that particular verse caught my attention one time in that Lectio Divina. And I just stayed with that verse. And I began to think, I began to look back on the times that had been so difficult for me. And I could see that after each of those very dark, painful periods, there was a place of resurrection. There was a place of rebirth. Uh, but also in reflecting on those dark times, they were so painful that I did not see God connected with them. And so this particular verse coming up fairly recently, again, though, like, like movies will come to you with dialogue. Bible scriptures come to me at, at certain times. <laughs> right. And so this was something I had been exposed to in my own study. I don't know that uh, it was ever, t well, I'm sure it was talked about in the sense of that, that God will uh, prune us. And maybe there was an example given. This would have been many years before this summer. But that scripture was one that popped up. Yeah, I think it's important to realize that when these things come to our mind, whether it's a biblical scripture or whether it's a scene from a movie or whatever comes to our mind, that's our unconscious, that's our God image sending us a message that it thinks we need to know. And it does that with an image that we would understand and which is in our psyche. So in your case, you had lots of biblical references in your psyche. In my case, I've seen th three or 4,000 movies, <laughs> many of them multiple times. And so I often get scenes coming up from movies, including dialogue from the very scene. And all of those are God telling us something that we if god thinks we need to know right that's so true and it's so important to pay attention to those things right and dreams also are part of that surely and i do i do get biblical references occasionally not at quite as often as you do but i sometimes get uh, uh bhagavad gita <laughs> <laughs> references also or whatever That's a beautiful book isn't it it is and yes it is and i get 
images from my own life because I've had many experiences in life and, you know, all sorts of things come up and they're, they're all ourself, the God image, trying to give us a message that it thinks we need to know. And traditionally that's always been seen as a message from God and whether it's a message from the metaphysical God or not uh, is sort of irrelevant because it's certainly relevant to our life what these messages are as they come up. There's real help in them. Real help. And, and strength. It, right. There's a scripture in the Old Testament. I can't, I can't tell you the reference, but it says God's eyes go to and fro in the earth looking to see who needs strengthening. Right. And that's been a great verse for me over the years. Do you know what the reference is? I don't. I can try to find it. Well, we don't need it now, but you can uh, give it to me and we'll, we'll add it in the description. Just to reiterate the point about the Job archetype, of course, many Christians don't like to look at two parts of the Bible. One is they don't like to look at the book of Job because they don't understand how Job is being pruned and, and uh, they don't like to look at the book of Revelation. And it's only by reading Dr. Young's work that I could understand what these books were about. And so just to reiterate, the Job archetype is some, you're doing something and you're defeated at it. doesn't matter if you're succeeding. If you're succeeding, you're just going to keep going on and keep succeeding until you're stopped. And, but when you're stopped, and we normally are stopped one way or another for whatever reason. I mean, professional football players are stopped because of age, <laughs> for example. Right. And, and so when that stop happens, they have to recognize it, realize that their body has defeated them because of age, and they can lament about the fact that they're aging, and then they have to go on with life, and so they're reborn into something else, and they either make something of themselves or they don't. Unfortunately, many of them get involved with drugs or something like that, but, but you know, many professional football players, for example, do wonderful things uh, for society after their, their football career or their you know, basketball career, whatever it is. And, but they've had this Job archetype, just as Job was having different roadblocks put in his life in, in the Bible, we all face that one way or another, whether we're a famous football player or whether we're a lousy f- football player or lousy at something else. I mean, maybe you're learning to play the flute and then all of a sudden... I don't know if you can hear me, Skip, but you've frozen. 